Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. In Missouri's history, the state has seen more than 7,000 state legislators. Fewer than 140 of those have been black. The Missouri Legislative Black Caucus helps them work together as a minority in the state capitol. And these days, most black legislators are twice a minority in Jefferson City. Republicans have a very large majority in the state house, And of the 22 members of the Legislative Black Caucus, all but one are Democrats. The exception is Republican Shamed Dogan, who represents part of St. Louis County. And that status can make passing legislation very difficult. But State Representative Steve Roberts Jr. still wants to try. He's chair of the Missouri Legislative Black Caucus, and he joins us in studio to discuss his goals and their goals for the session. So, Representative Roberts, welcome to the show. Honored to be here. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So first, how hard is it to get anything done in the House these days? Do you find the Republican majority even wants to hear your ideas? <laughs> it can be pretty brutal, but you know, to, to get things done these days, you've got to be able to work across party lines. And do you feel like, for the most part, your members want to do that, even though they're, they're so predominantly Democrat? I do. I do. So you've called for May 1st to be designated as Walt Hall Moore Day. Right. And apologies if I mispronounced that first name. Who was Walt Hall Moore? So he was the first um, African-American to serve in the Missouri legislature. And it was uh, in the 1920s. He was actually redistricted out of his um, his seat. And so then he ran again. And a few years later, was able to get back in the House. OK. He was redistricted out of his seat. Was that a coincidence or were they trying to get rid of, of the black legislator? That was intentional. OK. Um, was he able to get anything done while he was there? I mean, that must have been really hard back in the day as, as the first. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it was. And, you know, I haven't really tracked any of his uh, the legislation that he'd filed. May 1st. Uh, is that a particular day in his life? I believe it's his birthday. Okay. And is this one the whole caucus is behind at this point, or is this an individual passion? Uh, it was actually sponsored by Representative Kevin Windham. Okay. Now, you also want the legislature to denounce an 1852 Missouri Supreme Court decision. This involved Dred Scott. Um, Tell us what was happening there. Absolutely. So, you know, it's kind of been a tarnish on our state. You know, um, when Dred Scott, the ruling that came down, which pretty much said that African-Americans had no um, rights that were promised to them under the Constitution. So this would just be a piece of a House resolution that officially uh, denounces that court decision. Okay. So that wasn't the final step in Scott's journey trying to get his freedom. Ultimately, he ended up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. They're the ones who put the nail in the coffin. Why do you think it's important to formally renounce this Missouri decision? Well, it's it's really interesting. So Lynn Jackson, she's the great, great granddaughter of uh, Dred Scott. And I met with her and she spoke with us in the work that she's been doing to kind of spread awareness about him and his legacy. So she actually brought that uh, piece of legislation to me and it actually came through the House two years ago and it made it out of our chamber with broad support. There were only two votes in opposition. But, you know, we ran out of time at the end of session, weren't able to get it to the finish line. So we had a, a lot of co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. And I'm really hoping that we can get it done this year. So this is something the family is hoping for. Absolutely. And she'll actually be visiting our, our capital on February 25th. So it'll be really nice to kind of give her an update on the progress of it. So this may be something where just the compelling personal story could help you overcome the fact that, that you guys are in a minority as, as Democrats pushing this. Absolutely. OK. Now, bigger picture, um, these are two things that sort of deal a little bit with the past. And there's obviously so many problems in Missouri right now. Why do you think it's important to go back and sort of rectify these two cases? Um, I think that it's important that we never forget our history, you know, where we came from and that, you know, bringing attention to these issues, it's good. I mean, you know, for example, every, you know, American child learns about the history of Dred Scott. But, you know, who remembers the name of the judge who initialed that Supreme Court decision? Mm -hmm. So you'd like to see this be something maybe to raise awareness for it and also to, to put things back right. Absolutely. Now, you've also got two bills, and they look at criminal justice reform today. One of them has to do with Crime Stoppers. How would this change existing state law? So right now, and several other states have done this as well, is it defi- would define uh, communications between um, an anonymous individual calling into an organization like Crime Stoppers a privileged communication. So that, you know, I'll tell you, like, you know, when I was canvassing, 
last summer, a lot of times people would be concerned about retaliation or people finding out um, information about them because a lot of the folks would know who's causing trouble in their neighborhood. So this would just officially codify those types of um, communications and make sure that, you know, their information remains anonymous. So why is that necessary at this point? I feel like the one thing we all hear about Crime Stoppers is that your call is confidential. Right, right. Uh, Is it there's a sense that maybe people don't trust that? I think so. And that's why we've seen some more legislation passed in other states. So when you've got a, you know, you can point to a statute saying, look, it is privileged. So anytime like defense lawyers are trying to get that type of information, you can kind of be pretty confident that your information is secure. And there is a provision here um, where it says if a judge decides that this is relevant to somebody trying to prove their innocence, that this could be open. So it's not 100 percent that it's open, but the presumption seems to be somebody can count on the fact they're going to be anonymous. Absolutely. And that would be kind of be a situation we have an in-camera review with the judge. So it's not really being kind of put out um, in the public sphere, for example. Is that something these other states have done as well? They've sort of put that in the hands of judges. Yeah, because you don't want to do anything that's going to be highly prejudicial to a defendant. Like for some reason, let's say they find out that the person who called in was intentionally giving misleading information or this person has a history of calling in. And, you know, a worst case scenario situation, there is kind of a, a check in that system to make sure that, you know, if it was absolutely necessary that they could find that out. What do you think? Uh, do you think you're going to find colleagues in support of this, the Crime Stoppers? Yeah, I do. I actually, former Speaker uh, Catherine Hanaway, she's uh, been active with Crime Stoppers and has um, been helping with it as well. She's a former uh, U.S. attorney here in St. Louis. That's right. Uh, so she's got a lot of clout and <laughs> she's also a very prominent Republican. Sure. So you may see uh, your colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, supporting this one. Oh, absolutely. And I've spoken with several of them. Um, um, Vic Alred, Representative Alred, agreed to file a companion bill as well. So it's one of those bipartisan issues that um, people on both sides of the aisle can agree on. Okay. Let's also talk, you have a bill relating to firearms in the city of St. Louis um, and just the city of St. Louis. What would this bill do? Right. So I was a prosecutor in the city of St. Louis when our laws changed. So it used to be if you wanted to conceal and carry a firearm, you had to go through a permit process. You know, there was a background check, a foundational level of training. But when the legislature passed constitutional carry, that was abolished. So I would have law enforcement officers bringing in cases to me that I was issuing the week before that I could no longer issue. And a lot of times it would be a situation where, you know, they'd find someone who was illegally carrying a firearm. And because of that initial search, they would find drugs and other contraband. So I could no longer issue those types of cases because that initial reason for the search was that possession of the firearm, which was now Legal. So what this bill would do is it would create a carve out for the city of St. Louis to bring back a permit system if you want to conceal or open carry firearms. And what I was really looking for with this bill was to find a, a compromise position because I understand how my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in more rural areas, you know, maybe they they grow up with guns or they just don't see the kind of gun violence that we do in the city of St. Louis. And so what this would do is uh, it would allow them to keep their laws the way that they are and allow St. Louis to have some more common sense gun regulations. So the legislature hates gun control. What makes you think they might allow a carve out (laughs) for the city of St. Louis when it seems like so much of what they care about when it comes to guns is kind of the principle of the thing? They just don't want to see that Second Amendment erode in any way. Right. Well, I think, you know, when you hear in the news every day about another murder on, on both sides of the state, from St. Louis to Kansas City, dealing with gun violence, that, you know, it, you know, we've had several conversations with the um, governor's office and with the speaker as well, just trying to get these bills referred to committee. So, I mean, they want to do something. It's just like you said, that external pressure of us really being able to get it done. Are you worried, though, that this could mean criminal charges for, say, a black kid in St. Louis, whereas if some kid does this down in the countryside, um, he's going to face no problems for doing that. I mean, this seems like it solves one problem. Are you worried maybe it's going to create another? Yeah, I do. And I think that is a legitimate concern. But I think what we need to do is find a way to identify lawful versus unlawful gun owners. For example, um, the sheriff of the city of St. Louis, Vernon Betts, he showed me situations of guys walking around the courthouse with AK-47s. And, oh, and they can't do anything about that even? Right. And it's kind of like that situation where it's, you know, you're putting up a stop sign after you've got several kids have been run over, you know, until they've actually done something wrong. Whereas if, you know, we had a permit process, you know, you, they'd go up and just have to say, hey, can I see your permit? Okay. You know, no problem here, basically. And I've noticed you did make it a misdemeanor on first offense. If somebody does this twice, at that point, you're kind of saying they're asking for a felony. Right. Because absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, it's 
universal that a lot of times uh, in, in every society, young people will do something silly, but it's kind of can be unique to our country where that mistake, that felony conviction can follow them for the rest of their life. So, you know, I definitely want to avoid giving out felonies. And I typically oppose legislation that creates, you know, new crimes. So that's definitely something I'm aware of. We'll try to strike a balance of addressing gun crime in St. Louis City. So it seems like the one thing the legislature has been willing to do that would deal with the crime problem that we have in the city is they want to repeal the residency requirement for St. Louis police officers. I know this bill did quite well in committee. Um, How do you feel about it? Yeah, so we, and there's a lot of support from the city. So the chief of police, John Hayden, testified in favor of it. Our public safety director, Judge uh, Jimmy Edwards, came out and spoke in favor of it because they're down uh, almost 150 officers. So it's a huge problem. I think that it's something most people in the city want done. But the issue that we run into is you're, in a sense, subverting the local uh, board of aldermen, which, you know, I, I take issue with. So it's one of those situations, you know. I think in an ideal situation, the the board would pass it and get it done that way. But I understand why the mayor would reach out and try to do it through the legislature. So are you still on the fence at this point? Or do you know how you're going to vote um, if this bill comes? And again, if it, if it um, affects only St. Louis. I know there's been several versions of this, but say they want to repeal it just in the city. How are you going to vote? Right. So right, they, they had one bill that took it across the state and it went back through committee and they um, took it back. So they just narrowed it down to the St. Louis, city of St. Louis. And I'm, I'm not sure yet. You know, I'm reaching out. I've, you know, I'm in ward meetings every week, pretty much trying to see what the constituents want me to do because I can see both sides of the issue. But I think that something does need to be done. Seems like this is one where you can't win. Like you, on one right. hand, the board of aldermen, <laughs> they're going to be mad at you. On the other hand, the mayor and the police chief are going to be mad at you. Right, it's going right. to be really big. <laughs> Do you get a sense of, of which way your constituents are leaning? I think our, I think my constituents lean towards they want something to be done. I think that they want um, those vacancies to be filled. Okay. And the Black Caucus as a whole, has it taken a stand on this issue yet? No, similar position. And I, I think that's pretty across the board. Most legislatures are like, this seems like a local control issue. However, it's not getting done. There's that, however. And there's the support of, you know, the chief of police and the public safety director and the mayor of the city as well. Mm-hmm. Now, you've also supported two bills. These are written um, by colleagues, um, but you've said that you're in favor and these would let felons uh, basically have an easier reentry into society. One would allow convicted felons to sell alcohol and lottery tickets. Um, and the other, it's called the Fresh Start Act. This says that boards can't deny licensure solely because an applicant has been charged with a crime. Why are these bills important to you? Absolutely. So with the Fresh Start Act, I mean, so, you, you know, you could get a situation where um, we've had people pay a lot of money, for example, to get trained in a skilled labor area and then only to be denied because they've got that felony conviction. Now, you know, if you've got, let's say, something that deals with fraud and you're trying to be an accountant, I could see why that might make sense or be a fair reason for you to be denied that license. But, you know, if you want to you know, be a carpenter or some other type of skilled labor, there's no reason why you should be um, hindered for that in the future. So what that would do is it would require licensing agencies to identify, like, if they're going to say, well, you know, we're denying you based off this felony, there has to be a, a, a relation to it. What about this idea of allowing felons to sell alcohol and lottery tickets? I'll be honest, I didn't even know that they weren't allowed to do that currently. Right. And so uh, imagine, you know, you're a small business shop owner or something and you've, you know, you've got this person who's a convicted felon, stellar employee. They do a great job, haven't done anything wrong since. But, you know, they're, you know, working by themselves and someone comes in and they want to buy liquor or um, lottery tickets or something else. Now you have to spend more money to have an additional person there, which can be a strain on the business. Whereas, you know, if they were able to do that, they could kind of handle those responsibilities. Okay. So you think this could help maybe some of your constituents that own C-stores or have other small businesses? Absolutely. Okay. Now, there's another bill um, by a member of your caucus. That's Representative Alan Green of Florissant. He's filed a proposal to allow voters in St. Louis City and St. Louis County to decide if the museum taxing district should expand uh, to allow for the creation of an African-American History Museum. Do you support that bill? I do. Yeah, Alan's, um, he's our former chairman. He's been doing a lot of work, and um, he's actually been um, one of the, the people leading the charge to do a new disparity study for our state. And what would a, what would a disparity study do? Yeah, it, it looks at kind of like historically um, different um, uh, 
practices, businesses where there's been discrimination and looking at ways to kind of overcome that. Is this something the legislature would be commissioning or who would have to take the Correct. lead? Correct. So it would be, you need a legislative appropriation, which okay. is how, how it was done. I think the last one was, was just over five years ago. Okay. So that was obviously a different time in the state house. Do you think there's a chance you can get uh, the current administration or, or the people running uh, the leadership on board for something like that? I do. Okay. Well, you guys have a lot of stuff on your agenda. I'm wondering, what is your top priority as you look at the rest of this session ahead of us? Wow. Okay. My top priority, I definitely think for me and for my constituents, it's kind of those first two bills that we were talking about. That's why I pre-filed them, would be to address these issues of gun violence in our city and making sure that people have the confidence that if they know someone's doing something wrong, to make that call to reach out. Okay, so you'd like to see that Crime Stoppers bill move forward as well as basically bringing back requiring a permit for either concealed or open carry. Yes. Okay, well, best of luck to you as you're pushing this. As we said before, you... um, the Democrats are definitely in the minority there. It's going to take a lot to get even one of these through, but uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. State Representative Steve Roberts is chair of the Missouri Legislative Black Caucus. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.